<laughs> so, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am delighted uh, to have with me uh, Dr. Elspeth Whitby. Um, Elspeth is a radiologist who works in um, Sheffield. And Elspeth will be telling us, I think, a little bit about your career and how you got into um, fetal MRI. <laughs> but um, Elspeth has, has really made her name um, on becoming absolutely the UK expert in reading fetal MR. I mean, I think, I think unrivaled. We are wholly dependent um, on Elspeth's expertise here in Cambridge, uh, where she very kindly uh, works remotely and, and uh, helps us uh, either solely reporting or jointly reporting um, the, the, the cases for us, which is just absolutely fantastic. And over the years, she's developed um, great collaborations with many different hospitals around the country, mm -hmm. but it's such a specialised area. And of course, there's so many things hinge on what the MR is showing. Often, you know, it's come to MR through ultrasound um, or, or, you know, baby not growing or whatever, but usually ultrasound is still very much the main um, workhorse um, in pregnancy. Uh, but fetal MRI has been shown to have such amazing detailed information mm -hmm. for these fetuses. It, it, you know, it is, it is truly fantastic. And of course, great information about the placenta as well. So I'm going to hand over to Elspeth. Um, where, thank you so much for You're coming welcome. to Cambridge. We're just delighted. Uh, poor Elspeth, we had to keep moving this, this lecture on a number of occasions due to junior doctor strikes or train strikes or different strikes. So we're, it's wonderful that she's here. Um, and uh, Elspeth, over to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. that tidy 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 door. Door. And the pressure's on now. <laughs> so I just try and get the right slides. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the word to talk about is uh, where are we now and where are we going with fetal MRI rather than just what fetal MRI can do. So where are we now? This, this fetal CNS, most people seem to think that this is sorted. There's lots of studies out there, including the big uh, Meridian study. There's numerous systematic reviews, and there's a general acceptance that MRI adds to ultrasound, and with abnormalities of the fetal CNS that are picked up on ultrasound, that MRI should be done. There's increasing availability for it for the central nervous system, and reporting knowledge locally is increasing um, for most of the centres in the UK. However, it's very ad hoc. <clears throat> you know, who gets it at what gestational age is debated. Centres tend to choose at what gestational age they want to image. There are no guidelines on how to perform it, what sequences to do, what's useful, what's not, how to report it and what we should reporting and what's useful for the obstetricians or the parents and the timescales. And there's been a recent survey showing that parents are really upset about the time it takes from referral to actually get the MRI to then get the report. Should we share the slides on the Zoom Absolutely. again? Sorry about that. Ah. And Ellis, can people hear okay? Yes, yeah, I think everyone's hearing okay. I think it was just there and a problem with the um thing but um sorry about that it's okay okay there you go okay right hopefully you can see the slides now too um so there's a, a group of parents now that are really upset about the length of time it takes sometimes it's two to three weeks from being requested the mri to actually it being performed and then another couple of weeks before the report is back and in a pregnancy that's actually a long time particularly with legal limits we're working around in this country so we're hoping to start and develop guidelines but it's a completely from scratch as there is nothing out there. So where are we with the fetal body? The fetal body lags behind. We seem to have split the baby into fetal brain and fetal body, and the brain has become more popular to do, more people are doing it, partly because it was started by the neuroradiologists initially 20 years ago. The fetal body is lacking, um, and there's lots of centers that send out reports saying, MRI of the fetal brain, we have not looked at the rest of the fetus. And given that there's lots of abnormalities that are linked and genetic conditions and syndromes, it just seems a shame to split up a baby. Um, we've still got ultrasound versus MR. We're still looking at how it's working. Is it any good? Where is it better? 
We're looking at diagnosis still at this stage, 20 years down the line. How does it change management and the outcome? And then is it cost effective? What do the parents understand by it? What are the additional stresses for these parents coming for an MRI scan, waiting for the results and getting the results? Is it worth it? And is it worth it with the clinical information we get? So this is just, sorry, this is a very busy slide. So this is just what we've done in Sheffield to try and sort this out. So we've looked back at nearly 200 cases now, and we're looking at comparing them and scoring them. So we score them by a panel of radiologists and obstetricians, and then we score them by another panel of radiologists and neonatologists. So what we're scoring is, did the ultrasound and MR give the same information? Did it change it, but not fundamentally? Did it fundamentally change, but could have affected management or counseling? Did it change it? Where was the ultrasound better? Or where was the MR incorrect at the end? And what we thought by doing this along with the obstetricians will pick up when they think we've, it's been of benefit clinically, not in an academic research exercise. And we'll also pick up by doing it with the neonatologist when it's been beneficial to them in the, in the comparing and the preparation for that baby being born and looking after that baby. And the obstetricians and neonatologists do grade differently. So it's really interesting that what information they see is important and what they don't, which is why we've done it this way around. And then we want to do it with established clinicians, i.e. coming towards retirement, and brand new clinicians who have been brought up with fetal MR as part of their workup compared to the old ones who are used to managing without it to see if there's a difference there as well. So this is what routine we found. We've, broke this, we've broken this up into body regions. So for example, if we look at the chest, it's similar in about 21%. No change in 27%, but alters management or changes management in 35% and change the diagnosis in 17. So in over half of them, we're having a maximum impact on that patient and that patient's care. And that's the change of management is predominantly the CDH cases. Change of diagnosis is a literally CDH, CCAM, CIS, complete change. Um, and I'll show you some rarities we've had in there. So overall, it's changing the diagnosis in quite a few of them. The ones where it seems to change it in really big numbers, uh, the numbers are small in the cohort. So the skeletal system, it's changing it in 30%, while numbers there are quite small and the same in the neck. And then we've looked at the outcome. So imaging was incorrect is a score four, and this is how we've graded our outcome scoring. So agree, the imaging agrees with the outcome, and for outcome we've used post-mortem, clinical imaging, and surgery. Um, imaging's missed information is two, and imaging's missed information that could have changed management or counseling. So the latter two are the ones that we are import, we're really keen on, the management and counseling change and an incorrect diagnosis. And again, it's a busy slide, but there's a fundamental change in a small percentage, reassuringly. Interestingly, we're struggling a little bit on the um, skeletal system, having seemed to be good in the actual diagnostic part itself, and then missed information. All. So it's not huge what we're missing, but there is still some misinformation there. And what we were trying to work out by all this was, was there a system that we weren't very good at? Was there a pathology we weren't very good at? And was it because we couldn't be good? because the inherent difference between ultrasound and MR was a cyst was a cyst in the abdomen, or was it that we actually didn't have the knowledge and the experience to be good? So we're getting there, but as you can see, we're very early on in it. We're not established at all. Diagnostic accuracy overall, and you can see there for each system. So the chest, which is probably the one we first started with in the body, is our best one. The one we started with last, which is the, the renal system, is our worst form. So there is an element of experience in there, and that seems to be reflected when you look at the literature. Um, the neck, it says 100% there, the numbers are small, so that may change as our numbers get bigger. But overall, our diagnostic, diagnostic accuracy is good, but I think we can get better. So if we look at the fetal lungs, the sort of diagnosis we're after is a CDH, so diaphragmatic hernia, or a cystic malformation, big difference in the way we counsel those patients and their outcome. Emphysema, trying to separate that out from the cystic malformation is really important. The cystic malformations tend to just 
shrink down and not have an impact after birth unless they're really big. The emphysemas will often air trap after birth. So you end up with a baby who's trying to breathe and is just trapping air and it's getting harder and harder and they need urgent surgery. So really important to try and separate those two. And then we've got other abnormalities like bronchogenic cysts. MR can give additional information, and this is where it's always going to provide that advantage over ultrasound is in the lung volumes of diaphragmatic hernias. And it can show you the effects of the pathology. So recently we've got a baby going through who's got such a large amount of cystic malformation, it's squashing the heart and the mediastinum against the ribs of the thoracic wall. And that's ending up with a fluid buildup and high drops in that baby. And we can work out why that's going from the imaging we've got. So we can work out the diagnosis and the effects. However, we do have problems. Um, and these are just a few examples because radiologists always like to show their pictures. Um, so this is an area of cystic malformation. Hopefully the cursor will share as well. Again, usually in the lower lobe, high signal, expansive, so can cross the midline, can display them, displace the mediastinum, and you can see it on the axial images. If this was in the upper lobe, I'd be more concerned of emphysema. And here we have one that's an emphysema. So this is in the upper lobe, which is classically where it is. And this looks like a dilated bronchial tree. You can imagine the branches coming off in the dilated little alveoli. Um, this is another lobe emphysema. Again, you can get the impression this is a dilated uniform pattern rather than the irregular cysts that you get in the C-camp. And this is much bigger. It's expanding, it's compressing the lower lobe, it's moved the mediastinum across, it's having an impact on the opposite side. And this is postnatally. And we sat on the neonatal intensive care, took several images of this baby when it was expanding and people were discussing what it was and what it needed to do. When the local surgeon who's not known for mincing his words said, I don't give up what it is, we just need to take it out. <laughs> he took it out and the other lung expanded and the baby could breathe properly everything settled down and the baby was able to get home so we now want all our emphysemas bought, born centrally or all those we think might be an emphysema just in case we get this air trapping post delivery this is another really unusual case this came through as a late diagnosis of a diaphragmatic hernia there was mediastinal shift and the fetal medicine specialist doing the scan said to me, you may think I'm mad, but it's not quite right. It doesn't look quite like a CDH, but I don't know why. And this is actually a pericardial tumour. This is actually all in the pericardium. So it was shifting the mediastinum across. It was a cystic abnormality, which was mimicking the bowel, but definitely worth finding out. So this poor lady who presented late to her DGH and was transferred across to us in Sheffield, then ended up being transferred to Leeds because it was a cardiac problem. We wanted the baby born in the safest place. And all that happened within several hours. So the MR was pivotal in getting her to the safest place for delivery of her baby. This is what we see in a diaphragmatic hernia. So on this side, on this side you can see the normal lung, normal lung shape, normal signal intensity of this mid grain, very uniform. Bit of normal lung on the opposite side. And then we've got small bowel, which is fluid filled, large bowel, which is meconium filled, so dark or bright if you do a T1 scan. So T1 is really good for picking up meconium and a little bit of the liver up there as well. And then we can calculate the lung volume. So that all sounds great. It all sounds as if we've got it sorted and we know what we're doing. So why do I say we're not? Uh, recently, we decided to look at the way we did lung volumes. So I've got my own in-house data. So I know where, how I generated that data, how I drew around the lungs to work out the lung volume, how I calculated it and what I've plotted. I was referred a case where a baby uh, was said to have a very poor lung outlook, but the images I looked at didn't look as poor as what they were given. So I looked at the images and thought, this looks about 50%. And the report gave a lung volume in mils and then said this is 25% of predicted. So I measured it. I got exactly the same as they got in mils. They'd used a public, published equation to calculate the expected lung volume from MRI published data. So we pulled the published data. We looked at five different lots of published data. 
and we took our own lung volumes and we put that in. So this is what the neonatologists give the prognosis on. So it's less than 25% of expected lung volume. They will say your survival is 25%. If it's more than 45%, if you've got half your lung at least, then they'll say it's 95% survival. And that's on the total lung. So that includes the good lung, not the lung on, as well as the lung on the herniated side. So given that less than 25%, you're given a 25% survival, greater than 45% and 95% survival. We took our own data and we plugged in all those equations. Each of these set of four to five different colors is an individual patient with the data plugged into the different equations. So the yellow line is the 45% cutoff. So above that line, you predict a 95% survival. Below the red line, you predict less than 25% survival. And you can see just how many of those cases clicked into a different prognostic group purely and simply on what, which equation you chose to use. We have no control over what anybody's doing. This is frightening. Um, particularly that two patients actually went from 25% to 95% survival. And we're counseling parents on it. This is probably more important for the neonatologist to realize than the radiologist. But what I would say is it's really good if you calculate this, if you then look at the images and guesstimate what you think it looks like. And if it's different to what you've calculated, just recalculate it or have another look or ask somebody else. I went across with the case we'd had referred through and said to a colleague, right, we're playing guess the lung volume here. And we'd moved it from 24% total lung volume to 59% total lung volume. So put this baby out of the categories. I think we've a long way to go and we need more data. And all the data that we've got is small and all these equations were produced from small amounts of data and we need to know how it was produced. We've also decided to have a look at absent stomachs because people say if the baby's not got an ab a stomach that's visible on ultrasound, it's likely to be an esophageal atresia or a tracheoesophageal fistula. And it's probably about as good as tossing a, toy, tossing a coin for the diagnosis. So not to be put off, um, to say, is it worth doing? We went thinking maybe volume will help. And we had no idea of the normal range of the stomach volume. And clearly it fills up and it empties. And does that affect anything? So we're only part way through this data at the moment. Um, but this is the sort of thing, if you've not got this, which is a definite atresia, because we've got a dilated esophagus with a blind loop here, then you're literally relying on the stomach having fluid in or not. So up to now, this is how far we've got. So we've looked at 29, 35 that have been referred for MRI. Um, and then we've sent out a report, and 29 of them saying we still suspect it because the stomach isn't as good as it should be. In the ones we've said the stomach is okay, we've been correct. But for the rest, we're not much better than ultrasound. So unless we can improve that somehow, or unless we can try and see that bolus going down, or unless we can find a way of increasing that, and we're going to look at stomach volumes and see if the volume of fluid helps us increase our um, <clears throat> suspicion of it, then is it really worth doing the MR? Is it really worth the cost to the NHS? And is it worth the stress to the patients just to say, well, we're still left with this uncertainty? The only caveat to that is, do we find anything else on the MRIs? And we're going to go through and pull out if we found any additional abnormalities, but from knowledge at the moment, I don't think we have. So what about kidneys? Our diagnostic accuracy is quite good. Our prognosis, can we? It's a bit of a guesstimate. There's no data to aid the surgeons. So we were approached by the pediatric surgeons to say, I use the AP diameter of the renal pelvis on ultrasound. If I don't get that, I don't know I can use the MR one. Nobody's shown to me that it's equivalent. Therefore, I can't prognosticate on it. Um, I've got no MR data to prognosticate on. Please, can you do it for us? You know, like overnight, can you produce the data? Then I can talk to my patients. Um, we know that DWI suggests function. 
So if you can see the kidneys on a diffusion scan, they are functioning renal parenchyma. What we don't know is, could we quantify that? So infrapenny, infrapound, we thought, yeah, let's go for it. So these are the sort of things we were trying to work out for them. Big cysts, multicystic, dysplastic kidney, might have a bit of renal function in utero, but unlikely to be functioning renal tissue afterwards. And then slightly abnormal kidney on the other side, but functioning on DWI. There's the bit of parenchymal function on the DWI of the cystic kidney. There's a lovely amount of function on the other side. So we decided to try and quantify that from the ADC values. I'm sorry, this is just to show you that if you send a patient to me and you ask me to do the kidneys and I do everything else, I'll find you something else. Um, this is an ileal, dilated ileal loops. This baby's got ileal atresia as well. So we've now added a second problem into that baby. And the parents need to be aware that this may be taking them down a different abnormality. So we're now thinking about barter vactral syndrome and we're starting to look for spinal or skeletal abnormalities and checking the stomach and the esophagus. Um, we followed this patient up. So there's the non-functioning MCDK kidney. There's your other kidney. Fluid in the bladder, normal amount of amniotic fluid. So this kidney, although it's in an odd position, is holding its own. It's got a decent amount of parenchyma and the dilated loop of bowel hasn't really changed. And we should have a white strip down here of meconium, which we're not seeing. So we know this is blocked. It's a little bit of meconium there. And a little bit of thin loops of bowel there. And this is much too thin. So we know there's not much getting through. <clears throat> Another renal obstruction case. So this is a big bladder this time with most likely posterior urethral valves because we've got the posterior urethra dilated up. Very dilated kidney, possibly a duplex on that image. Dilated kidney on the other side. Little bit of renal function. What we do know is that that isn't, a, that's, the, that's the kidney function, that's the kidney function, sorry. With this isn't enough. The renal function on DWI should be a similar intensity to the brain or the placenta. So the degree of whiteness and brightness should be about the same as the placenta or the brain. You can usually get fetal brain or placenta on the same slice to compare it to. So we <clears throat> followed this family up and this is what happened. So suddenly we've got cyst, post-obstructive cysts forming and the whole of that parenchyma is now no longer functioning. Still got the obstructed outlet to the bladder, and we've still got a more typical pelvic seal dilatation here with some diffusion. So they were wanting to know what the renal function was going to be like in this baby. Was it going to be enough? So in the meantime, we found the renal length. We showed that our renal length, which is the pale lines, is the same as what's published on ultrasound. So we know we can compare ultrasound for MR for renal length. So that was helping the urologist straight away because they hadn't got that data. So they knew they could rely on us saying what the renal length was and compare it to ultrasound data and be happy with that. We also showed them that the AP diameter was pretty comparative. We weren't too worried about that, a little bit out, but not much. I could also show them the AP diameter in the abnormal kidneys was different to the normal kidneys. So we've now allowed them to start using the information from MR that they weren't doing before because they didn't have that data to tell them they could use it and they were worried about using it. <sighs> we were able to tell them that an AP diameter of greater than seven millimeters predicted pathology and reduced renal function. We could also tell them that ADC value was hopeless to try and calculate because the babies move. So when we wanted to calculate the ADC value, it took the three B values it was doing on the DWI and amalgamated them and produced an image for the ADC. And unfortunately, the baby had moved enough that that wasn't always renal parenchyma we were measuring. So unless we can stop the babies moving, which is near on impossible, or we can actually get a quicker DWI sequence, we're stuck. What we do know is if you eyeball it, you can work it out. So if the DWI signal in that kidney is less than the brain or the placenta, that is likely to be poor renal function at birth. If it's the same as the brain and the parenchyma, it's likely to be good renal function or normal renal function at birth. 
So we've got something we're working with that helps. And because we've got an internal parameter that our control is actually on the same image, we think that's okay. And we're working with it. We're trying to pull out more and do more volume. Can we do the volume of the parenchyma itself and see if that helps predict outcome so that we can give parents a chance of whether it's worth thinking about continuing the pregnancy, knowing they're not going to go down a transplant role or whether there's a chance that they may end up having to go down a transplant route. So other body areas. Muscles have started to come through now, and these are a little bit harder, and I've put a normal in to show you. So this took me ages to work out what was wrong with this baby. It had very small lungs, but we didn't know why until we realized actually we could see the bones, and we don't normally see the bones because the muscles are so dark that you normally see a black limb like here with the cartilaginous ends being brighter. And suddenly we've got a shaft here and reduced muscle bulk, particularly on this, this slice. So you can see the bone and you can see how bright the muscle is. Not always, but sometimes it goes bright on T1. And the majority of these have got a myopathy of some sort. And if you see it and you can see it in the costal muscles, you know that this baby's really going to struggle to breathe and that's really a poor outlook for them. So you can start to add in additional information as to why these lungs are small, why they've not developed, or if you've got a baby who's not moving properly, often it's thought to be an arthrogryposis. If you can pick up something like this, you're putting it into a myopathy, you can get the parents to the geneticists. There may be a genetic link there. It may have an implication for future pregnancies. So we're moving further along with the muscles. We haven't got any idea of muscle bulk yet and size and volume. It's all waiting to be done. So if anybody wants to do a PhD in any of this, there's shit loads of work to do. Um, thought I'd put a few neck ones in for you. Um, the neck lesion, realistically, the obstetricians or the neonatologists aren't bothered what it is. They can see on ultrasound if it's a mixed solid and cystic, it's likely to be a teratoma. They can tell you how big it is. They're not interested in any of that. They know that information. What they want to know is, is the airway patent? Can we get this baby out? Will it breathe? And if the airway is not patent, can we get an airway in if we deliver it with an exit procedure? And from the neonatal point of view, they want to know what the lungs are like. So if we do get this baby out and we do get an airway in, is it actually going to breathe on its own? or are we making a rod for our own back and then leaving the parents with a difficult decision? So they're not too interested in diagnosis, which is a very different way of approaching radiology, where we tend to want to give a differential diagnosis. They're not too bothered. So the things we've been sent, this is a goiter. This is a very big, uniformly enlarged bit of tissue. The airway, which is the white line, fluid filled trachea is patent, clearly patent. The T1 was a salvation here. There's not a lot else that's that shape in the neck of the fetus to say that this was a goiter. Um, the parents were, well, how many of these have you seen? And you're going, mm, one. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't fill them with confidence. Um, but this was followed up by the endocrine team who were also struggling because they'd never been sent a patient that hadn't been born yet. Um, so with getting contacts across the world, we managed to work this one out with a bit of help. Um, so that's a go to, and that airway was perfectly clear. And then the only decision was, was will that airway remain clear? And can we do a normal straightforward cesarean? I, you know, I think the answer there is yes. And a go to should be soft enough to be able to put a tube down if it collapses down. This on the other hand, is a typical solid and cystic teratoma. This is compressing the airway. We can see the top part of the airway. We can see the bottom bit. This is predominantly solid. It's going to be very hard to get a tube in there. We can't get a tube down. We're pushing against predominantly solid tissue. Um, if we're trying to do a tracheostomy, we're going to have to go in here. Um, things that I've learned over the time is the length of the neonatal tracheostomy tube is four centimeters from end to end. So if it's more than four centimeters at late gestation, which this one was, unfortunately, there is no chance. And you might as well measure it and let them know. <laughs> this one, however, <clears throat> is predominantly fluid. So although it's massive and we only see the bottom part of the airway ever, 
considering this is the tumor and this is the baby's brain, um, we knew we could drain that um, fluid out if we had to. So we couldn't get a tube in, the anesthetists were there, pediatric anesthetists and the neonatologist couldn't get a tube down, drain this, did the tracheostomy, this started to fill up with blood. So they did a grab and run and took the baby to the next theater and resected everything. And all we lost was the thyroid gland. Everything else was intact. Um, these are a little concerning and this again is experience and it's just because I've done loads that I've worked this out um, and I missed it the first time round. So this is a sarcoma, this is uniform. So it's a uniform signal, the same as muscle, it's a sarcoma. The importance of this is it will be malignant. So you don't want any biopsies of it and you don't want anybody trying to drain it. And you do want it to be dealt with as soon as possible after birth. And we've now had three or four of these come through and they've followed that pattern. Uniform gray mass in the neck that doesn't follow the pattern of a goiter, then think sarcoma, think malignancy, think delivery and get this baby dealt with by the oncologist straight away. Otherwise you've missed your opportunity. But the majority of them are seen very quickly now and the outlook is good. I put this in because we all have to have one we show off with, but the video isn't working, unfortunately. <laughs> so this is uh, an ectopia cordis. But at the time, I wondered what they wanted me to work out for them. They wanted lung volumes and they wanted to know what the bony sternum was like. Could we work out that so they could plan the surgery? So that was the clinical question. They didn't really want views of the ectopia cordis. And unfortunately, the cine doesn't work. Um, so this is a cross section through the body and that is the heart that's out. And you can see the heart and the chambers of the heart on this sequence that's out there. And this is a cine that's not working, unfortunately. It took about three minutes for that to come off the scanner to go into our MR physicist collection of interesting cases. <laughs> and this is another cine that we're trying to do for esophageal fistulas, because if they've got um, esophageal atresia, particularly, they will spit back the amniotic fluid when they swallow. And if you can get that on the cine, then you get this little puff of amniotic fluid coming out. So you see the regurgitation. So rather than trying to follow the bolus down, you wait for it to come back up and come out and imply that. So there's lots of things you can do, but say we're still trying to find out where we're going completely. That, that video, might be worth trying that video. That, try that. Because it came up. Yeah. Um, Is it not? Oh, not No. Thank you. It's a shame because it's very pretty. It looks like we've all named it Puff. The magic dragon sort of thing. I've put this in because this is completely new um, over the last couple of years, changed to the way that fetal MR is working. Suddenly the geneticists have become incredibly interested, far more than they ever were, um, because of the importance of phenotype. And I was a little bit behind with where we were going with the genetics and how we have all these whole exome sequences we can do, or we can do whole genetic sequences and we can pick up abnormalities, but we don't know if that abnormality equates to the problem the baby's got. So suddenly the phenotype has become really important. And if the phenotype fits what is known from that abnormality genotype, then it's more important. If the phenotype doesn't fit, it's likely to be a silent genetic abnormality is my very basic understanding and they have hot and cold genes, and hot genes are more important than cold genes. So phenotypically, they want that information. So it's not unusual now to get an email from a geneticist saying, can you review the images? You've seen this, this, and this, we're looking for, and they give you a whole list of other stuff. And you go back and have another look to see if there's any of that there. And the more there is, the more likely it is to fit to that genetic pattern. So very different way of working again but I've brought you some. This is actually a case that came from Cambridge. So this is the normal molar tooth sign that we're all taught about for Joubert syndrome. So we've got this interpeduncular fossa there, and we've got these very elongated cerebellar peduncles. This was the case we had where we got the elongated peduncles, but we hadn't got any interpeduncular fossa. So I've just put one up next to it to show you what we were missing. Um, 
but the rest of it was there. So this one I reported is this wasn't typical of Jubers, but had some of the features of Jubers. The family had a history, not of Jubers, of something else, but an abnormality. Um, and this is what the geneticist came back with and tested the family for it. And the child that already got had that. This fetus also had the same abnormal gene. The parents both had a different type of abnormality, but both of those abnormalities would have produced Jubers if they'd matched, but they didn't. So it was a genetic pull out of all the information and trying to go back to the MR as to what we could see phenotypically. And then this is another recent case where we've had a similar thing. So on the sagittal section, I'd picked out this high arch palate. We'd picked out the high forehead. I don't think there was much else that we picked. <clears throat> the brain isn't quite right, but the shape's okay. There's a few little bits of folding that aren't normal. So subtle abnormal in the folding area. And they came back um, with this syndrome saying, has it got the dolichocephaly? Has it got craniosynostosis? You've got the prominent forehead. You've got the narrow high arch palate. Can you have a look at those eyes again? What's the ocular proptosis or not? And then we've got some basic data for measuring the eye size and the proptosis. And this didn't fit with that, but the majority is fitted with the syndrome and the genetics was done to look for that because they can't just send the DNA of the baby off and say, please do a shopping list and tell me what DNA is wrong. They've got to send it with a targeted possible reason as well. So they were able to sort this one out for them. <clears throat> we're way behind on white matter disease, even though we sorted out the brain. This brain is abnormal, subtly abnormal. The gray matter is, well, either the white matter is too bright or the gray matter is too dark. And I usually go for white matter is too bright. Um, but what I usually end up doing is pulling up images of the same gestational age of a baby that I know has been okay. So either a family history or a ventricular megaly case and comparing it and seeing if it's different. And then when you send this out, you're sending out a white matter abnormality quite late in pregnancy. There's a lot of information to try and get before the baby's born or the parents choose to end the pregnancy based on the MR. Um, and the DWI is also abnormal and you only see that when you compare it with other DWIs. Um, so there's a lot riding on it because it's picked up late. And it's usually picked up as this one was with very mild ventricular megaly. And we'd be really good if we could quantify this somehow, if we could quantify signal, if we could compare the gray matter to the white matter and say, you know, this comparison or the ratio should be whatever or less than whatever and above that is abnormal to give people confidence. And then I've put a few cloacal ones in because um, we've had a run of these and the first one, as always, you spend ages trying to work it out and get part way there, but never the rest of the way there. So on ultrasound, they'd seen this very abnormal looking bladder, but actually this is the bladder. As the pregnancy progresses, and it's happened in three or four cases now, this dilated structure, which we think is the vagina, so this is a hydrocolpos, compresses the ureters because they're going past into the bladder there. So they then get renal dilatation and we then get hydronephrosis. And depending at what stage that starts, how bad it gets. We then dilate up the, the uterus on top, or in this case, both uteruses on top. So we've got a bicornuate uterus, and then we get ascites as that fluid then ends up going down the fallopian tubes to give you what we think it is lately has been labeled urinary ascites because they thought it was coming from the bladder. But it's ascites of fluid building up, which must come from the bladder from a connection from a complex cloacal abnormality. And then you play chase the rectum. So you're looking for this tiny little bit of white down there, which is far too small, um, far too thin, but you're left, is this squashed? Or is this just too small? Is this like a microcolon or a degree of obstruction? And have we got a retral atresia to go with the whole cloacal abnormality? And it's getting as much information as you can before they have to go for surgery. This is another one. This one's added a uterine didelphus in, so we've got two vaginas. 
to add to the problems to sort out, but exactly the same clinical picture. This cystic lesion thought to be a bladder, what this time thought to be a bladder with a septum, is actually a hydrocolpos with the uterus on top, which is there, and then that's spilling out and the bladder is at the front. So we're left with a cloacal abnormality, the hydrocolpos squashing the ureters, giving you your um, hydronephrosis. Kidneys are working quite nicely. You can see that DWI, you can compare it to the brain, you can compare it to the placenta. It's functioning as it should be. There's the rectum on the T1. And then I put this in because we missed these, but these are rib abnormalities at the back, which you can see on the plain film afterwards, but we're actually there on the MR. And then this is the next one. <laughs> Once you've got one sorted out, or once you've learned from one, you then to pick up. And this is probably where I have advantage because I report from several centres. So these have all come from different places. So if individual radiologists were reporting on their own, they'd still just see n equals one. Whereas we've now got n equals four, we can try and get this information out. Um, and this one presented initially with two fluid filled cystic areas. We weren't sure what was going on at this point, but we knew that the lungs were also small because of the compression of the size of the cyst, elevating the diaphragms. We then got the ascites, and this is rectum. We then ended up with the hydrocolpos and the bilateral um, uteruses. So, and we think this originally had a septum. So we think this was a didelphus originally, but the septum was broken in it. And then this is the bladder at the front, and this is the cytes. So if I want to completely put a spanner in the works, and this is probably where my high horse is going for the next few years, is I don't want us to separate brain and body any longer. And if we do separate who reports the brain and who reports the body, can we at least make sure both are reported in the same center and somebody checks the bit they don't want to report? This baby has got subtle brain abnormalities, a problem there and a problem there. She's also got a huge amount of ascites and very small lungs. So there's clearly a problem here. And this baby was sent for the brain. If nobody had looked at this, the small lungs will predict the outcome in this baby, irrespective of what else is going on. So we need to know that. This is a diaphragmatic hernia. But just there, just on the edge of the film, the classic thing we teach our first years, <laughs> the classic thing that we teach our first years that I missed um, is this. And I only saw this on the fourth look at these images in the MDT and suddenly went, um, <laughs> oh, and everyone's like, well, why did you miss it? It was there on the first set of images. This is the second set, just about. Um, but we brought them back. And we've got a falcine sinus to that as well. And we've got an atretic encaphysial. So it didn't make a difference to the patient's outcome, but it's there. And maybe we should be doing brain and body. Or this one. Abnormal shaped skull, far too much extraaxial CSF space around that. Sent for the brain, black diaphragm, abnormal kidney, bit of fluid. So we need to start looking at the rest of the body. Oh, this one, very abnormal looking hernia. This was actually part of a hernia. This is fluid, part of a diaphragmatic hernia. Abnormal facial profile, very small nose, small nose, abnormal diaphragmatic hernia, palistochillian, which is genetic abnormality. So again, really important. Or oh, this one. So this is a big dural sinus fistula. It's pushing the brain forward. It's not damaging the brain, but it's displacing the brain significantly. More of a worry is this, is huge. So at this point, once we've got the images of the head, I said to the radio, right, down to the chest, please. Let's get some views of that, where that vessel's going. Look at the size of this baby's heart. So this baby's already got cardiomegaly from the alteration of the hemodynamics because of the dual sinus fistula. So it's no longer the dual sinus fistula that's worrying us in this baby, it's will it go into heart failure? And at what point we need to deliver this baby? So we've lost interest in the brain almost. We know it's there, 
We know they displace things, we know they can get smaller, but we've got huge effects on the rest of the body that are going to predict the outcome of that baby. And that baby was born in Great Ormond Street with cardiac failure, really struggling. They managed to get some um, little bits of glue into the dural sinus malformation, but the baby ended up with cardiac failure and necrotizing endocolitis and sadly passed away. Or this one, this is one of our most recent ones where 29, <clears throat> 29 weeks gestation and the mum had come with reduced fetal movements, having had a ab completely normal pregnancy until then, had COVID at 26 weeks, mild dose of COVID, better within a couple of days, felt fine. Three weeks later, reduced fetal movement. This placenta is grossly abnormal. This is like, we've got changes of hypoxia in it, but the placenta itself is a big giveaway. And on diffusion, there was no signal from that. Sorry, I didn't put that image in. So this is COVID placentitis, which is known to put down fibrin in the placenta and reduce the blood flow. Our biggest issue is now there's not enough data to pull out a baby if we see this early and give them problems of prematurity. But we know the chances are that the baby will become hypoxic if we leave it in there. But there is no data to base that on. There's just gut instinct on what you do. This was sent through for the brain. And there is the chest abnormality as well. So we've put this as probably Appert syndrome, um, given the different clinical features, but we've also added in a chest problem. So where are we? We still need some basic normograms. We haven't got the basics. We need some guidelines, which we haven't got for the entire UK. There's some random little bits internationally that say, well, you can do it if you like in this, and it may be useful in that, but actually don't say what you can do. We need consistency. Do we do all the fetus? You know, I've shown you a few cases, but how few and far are they between? And is it worth it? Who reports what and where? Who scans what and where? And what do the patients want at the end of the day? What are their preferences? So we've got studies going out now trying to do a lot of this, but there's still loads to do. And we're trying to get the guidelines, but it's whether in that guidelines we recommend doing brain and body every single time, or whether we just stay to the targeted area and report the bits that we see in a random fashion. So no, we don't need that one. So yeah, so if we finish there, hopefully that's given you an idea of, we've actually got very, very little um, knowledge on what we're doing, truthfully. We can do it. We've shown it's better than ultrasound, but is that enough? Or should we show more? Do we need to know more? And I think there's still a lot to do with this and a lot to fish out and do. So if anybody's interested in doing any sort of research anywhere in the UK, they'd be welcome. <laughs> Thank you.